Hi everyone, welcome to History Off-Road. My name is Rory Cox, uh, I am a historian, but I'm also a lover of the outdoors, off-roading in particular, but biking, hiking, trail running, fishing, all of the above. And really, what I want to do in a series of videos is just to share my passion about history as well as the great outdoors. And of course, one of the best ways to get out there and see stuff is with 4x4 vehicles. And that's what we'll be focusing on in these series of kind of trips that I have planned. So here is the Land Cruiser. So it's a 120 Land Cruiser 2004 model. Uh, and it's pretty much stock. You can see that it's just had some refurbished black alloys. Previous owner did this. I kind of like them actually. Um, I've just stuck on my Overland Bound membership emblem, which is kind of cool. Um, at the moment, it's just on standard rubber as well, 265, 65, 17s. But that is getting changed tomorrow. I'm getting some BF Goodrich ATKO2s put on, slightly larger, the 265, 70, 17s. So it'll give me a tiny, tiny increase in height. Um, you can see there's loads of space under the arches to accommodate those larger wheels. So there shouldn't be any problem with rubbing. The side steps might take those off at some point. Haven't decided yet. They'll probably come off. So this is actually the basic uh, LC3 model, the most basic of the models. And I went for that for, for two reasons, really. One is that the LC3s, as well as the center diff lock, they have the selectable rear diff lock rather than traction control, which uh, the LC4s and LC5s have. Um, and the other reason was because of this rear mounted tire. Uh, most of the LC4s and LC5s have the tire mounted under the chassis. But obviously if you're out you know, in the middle of nowhere and you're in, in mud or a deep rut, then getting to a, a, a spare under the chassis is that much more difficult than the rear mounted option. So that was the reason why I wanted the LC3. Just slightly fewer things, you know, to, to go wrong. No air suspension, it's all coils. Uh, this came with this tow ball, which I'm going to take off. I have no need for that. Um, and instead, I'm going to get a high tuck rear hitch receiver, two inch hitch receiver. These trucks don't actually have really any rated recovery points as standard, which is a bit frustrating. So I've got a high tuck hitch receiver coming, which I've ordered from the States from a company called Metal Tech. Um, and part of this bumper will have to get cut out and then the, the, the re receiver will bolt onto the rear cross member. Uh, and then I've got a Bush Ranger uh, receiver mount to, to, to put in that, which will give me a rated recovery point. Uh, I'm still investigating front recovery po options. Um, might have to get something shipped from Australia for that, so we'll see. Uh, but otherwise, like I said, it's pretty stock, 140,000 miles. Uh, considering it's 16 years old, it's in, in pretty good condition. A few minor scratches, a couple of dings, but nothing to worry about. Changed all the fluids and filters, so it's good to go there. And actually, I'm just really looking forward to getting it out and seeing what it can do. I've only driven a couple of very minor lanes so far on it. I've taken off the factory bash plates. They're just pretty rubbishy little ones and I've got some ARB steel underbody protection to put on that will be going on this week. That's the next kind of job to do. I'm also going to take off this chrome grill and spray it black I think just to make it look cool. Uh, other than that, the tyres, the ARB bash plates and the receiver hitch, that's all I've got planned for it at the moment. Ultimately, I would like to put a snorkel on it and you know raise the diff breathers, but these actually have a wading depth of 700 mils, which is pretty decent already, so a snorkel isn't a, an immediate requirement. Eventually also, a, a kind of a winch bumper would be great. ARB do a good one, Iron Man do a good one, but that's just gonna have to wait a little bit. Uh, and also probably a roof rack will go on there at some point too. But otherwise, that is about it. So these are the bash plates I took off, just the stock standard bash plates. You can see they're pretty rusted out. Oh, this one's not too bad, um, but they're thin. They're not, they're not super great. So those came off. 
and I'm going to put these ARB ones on. So it's you know, some gearbox transmission, the whole lot. So there's three separate plates and then a little transmission box as well in there somewhere. Uh, these are the steel plates. You can get uh, aluminium ones, which are obviously a bit lighter, but they're a lot more expensive. So I just went for the steel. And yeah, they should do the job really well. So they'll go on this week. And then it will be ready to go and explore. Okay, so you've seen the rig. Hopefully you like it. I've got some really big plans for it. I can't wait to take it onto the rough stuff and see how it behaves. But here's a story about history. This is one of my favorite stories about history actually, because it's so cool. It shows how everything is interconnected and how little changes can make big differences. And so this is the story of gunpowder and the emergence of the nation state in the European, late European Middle Ages and early modern period. So when did gunpowder first come about? Well, we know it was probably invented in China around 1000, uh, mainly used for sort of uh, firecrackers, not really used for military purposes. Gradually though, the recipe moves uh, westwards. It's really in the Muslim world during the 12th century that gunpowder is actually kind of militarized where cannon uh, are sort of invented that can be used on the battlefield in some military sense. But what is gunpowder? Well, essentially it's, it's three ingredients. Charcoal, you mainly get that from burnt wood. Uh, sulfur, the kind of stinky stuff that smells like eggs that you often get around volcanic areas and saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate. So it's basically those three key ingredients. Now, as I said, the ingredient, the, the recipe rather kind of moves westwards over time and eventually comes to Europe, probably through European interaction with the Muslim world. And we know that it's in Europe by the middle of the 13th century because there's an English Franciscan friar called Roger Bacon who writes about all manner of things, a real polymath. But he actually writes down the recipe for gunpowder in the middle of the 13th century. And he describes it as making this sound like thunder and a flash like lightning. So gunpowder though at this time is not really particularly effective as a, as a military piece of technology. We don't really see cannon, we don't see handguns emerging until a little bit later. By the end of the 14th century though, we do have cannons. We have cannons at the beginning of the 14th century, as early as 1313, there are cannons being recorded at a battle outside of Ghent. And at the Battle of Cressy in 1346, between the English and the French, the English actually use a type of cannon on that battlefield. But there's not really any real kind of powerful cannonry at this time. Handguns, very basic handguns, which are basically just metal tubes with powder stuck in the end and a ball that gets fired out are starting to emerge. But one of the things that's really hampering gunpowder technology is the cost of producing the powder itself. Now the charcoal, that's easy to get hold of. Loads of wood, no problems there. The sulphur, that can be imported from places like Italy, very mountainous areas, places like Mount Etna, Mount Vesuvius. But it's the saltpeter that's the problem, the potassium nitrate, because that's not easy to get hold of. At the beginning of the 14th century though, there's a breakthrough made in Germany. And God knows how they figure this out, but the, somewhere in Germany they figure out that you can get saltpeter from shit. Now, the most common agricultural animal of the period is the sheep. Okay, you get oxen as well, you get pigs obviously, but there's a lot of sheep in medieval Europe. And so sheep shit becomes the major source for extracting potassium nitrate or saltpeter. Now this has a massive impact on gunpowder production because it suddenly makes saltpeter widely available, the sheep everywhere, and as I said, you can actually use other forms of uh, manure, and it makes it cheaper. This leads to a huge expansion of the gunpowder industry, which leads to an expansion of the arms industry, the, the artillery industry, that is reliant on gunpowder. And throughout the 14th century into the 15th century, you see the gradual development of more powerful cannonry, the more, more powerful handguns. 
And it's this development which really leads to the type of armies that we see in the early modern period. Massive, massive armies using cannons, using handguns. You know, things like crossbows and, and, and bows still survive, for sure. But increasingly, it's the gunpowder technology, it's the artillery, which is becoming important. Now, how do you fund all of this? Well, you need taxes. And particularly in order to fund an artillery train, which is massively expensive at the time. It's only really big centralised kingdoms that can tax enough people to pay for this sort of weaponry and these sizes of army. And of course with the taxation and the military expansion, you slowly come to a period where you actually have what we would call the nation state, the centralised, highly complex, highly sophisticated, bureaucratic military state that effectively is what we, you know, governs or dominates the world today. Now that never would have happened, arguably, if gunpowder had not been invented and certainly if gunpowder had not been uh, produced and manufactured in the quantities that was necessary for those sorts of armies to become powerful. And that was all down to sheepshit. Thank you again for your time and this has been History Off-Road.